screen. Wonderful. So as we go through this, um, feel free to throw questions in the chat. We will keep an eye on that and monitor as we go along. As you probably noticed when you came into the room, we are recording this session for folks who are not able to be here tonight, as well as for you um, for posterity. We will also be sharing these slides. So do take notes, but you don't have to furiously scribble down everything that is on the PowerPoint. So without further ado, we will get started. So again, our agenda is gonna be an icebreaker just to get to know each other a little bit. We're gonna give a quick definition of national fellowships for those that may be new to this term or to the world of national fellowships. And just as a reminder to the rest of us, and then we're gonna talk specifically about the Fulbright US student program. And then we will talk about what Fulbright in general needs, what the process looks like for that national level. But USC also has its own on-campus process that is designed to support you throughout your application for the Fulbright. So we'll talk a little bit about that, important dates, important elements of that on-campus process that you'll do. And then we'll talk a little bit about what is next. So what are the next steps you need to do to get involved with Fulbright and how you can get started? So first off, icebreaker, if you could hop on a plane tomorrow, where would you go and why? And you can throw that in the chat. So where would you go and why? All right, awesome, Peru. You have family from there, never been, awesome. Yeah, I think that was the last international uh, trip I took was to Peru. Very cool. London, awesome. Australia, Argentina, India, a couple people visiting family, family connections, strong here. Iceland, that was actually what my answer was going to be. So very jealous of you, Chris. <laughs> Spain, oh, El Camino. Kat, you should, have you talked to Jen about that yet? <laughs> Singapore, I haven't, has she done it? Finland. Oh my gosh, twice. Yes. So anyone who wants to walk the Camino, you should talk with our director, Jen Bess. Um, she has done it twice and is very, very, very willing to talk about it and to share pictures and tips and all sorts of stuff. So definitely talk to her. Oh my gosh, we're going to have like a uh, National Fellowships El Camino uh, excursion. We're talking about doing a uh, some sort of International Fellowships uh, trip kind of as a pipe dream. But hey, you know, we could uh, fellowships along the Camino. Love it. Awesome. Some really cool um, times. Looks like a lot of you want to go to similar places. Um, Tennessee State, yes, to visit your sister. Again, family, very important. Um, so yeah, who knows? Maybe you all plan a trip together with all those destinations. So I think everywhere you mentioned, um, you could possibly go with Fulbright. So whether or not that's your final destination, I hope you um, do get to go where you'd like to go uh, soon. So just to get to know each other a little bit. So let's start off with my favorite, I guess, it, I don't know if it'd be a dad joke, an aunt joke, a millennial joke, anyways. Um, so this is courtesy of Matt Kloppenstein, who's in the room, wonderful uh, to have his contributions. But when I think of fellowships, first thing I think of is like the Fellowship of the Rings uh, by J.R.R. Tolkien. And so this wonderful tweet, now, for, now X, uh, says that you want me to apply for a fellowship after what happened to Baromir? And that's this guy, The Fellowship of the Rings. For those of you who haven't seen the movie or read the book, spoiler alert, does not end well for Boromir. He does not have a good time. But thankfully, you're not applying for a fellowship to take the ring to Mordor. You are applying to a national fellowship. So what is a national fellowship? It is a nationally competitive source of funding that is tied to an opportunity. So what do we mean when we mean national? We mean outside of USC. So this is funding from outside of USC that comes from things like the government through Fulbright, uh, foundations, different universities, different organizations, and they've de designated pots of money that they want students to apply for so that they can do cool things. So do experiences. So studying abroad, going to graduate school, research, teaching, internships, all those kinds of opportunities can be related to fellowships. What do we mean by competitive? That's a word that can be a little bit off-putting. But when we talk about national fellowships, what we're talking about when we talk about competitiveness is a lot about the fit of the fellowship. So 
there are a lot of people who are interested in these opportunities. And unfortunately, they don't have an award for every single person. So they do have a process by which you apply for these awards, are evaluated, and hopefully um, will receive them. But again, the competitiveness really depends on the fellowship. And even within a big fellowship like Fulbright, competitiveness varies wildly um, from award to award. So there may be some places like the ETA to Mongolia where there were three applicants and one of them got an award, a one in three rate. That's a great success rate for an award. Or there could be the UK Open Study Award, which attracts a lot of applicants. And so one person out of 250 got that award. So you can see how it varies. And really what you can do and what we want to focus on here, rather than numbers, is your fit for the fellowship. Particularly Fulbright, it's all about fit. It's all about how well your goals and your program that you want to do align with the mission of Fulbright, which is um, to enhance mutual understanding between the peoples of the U.S. and the peoples of other cultures through things like study, research, or English teaching, or creative arts projects. So that's what I mean when we talk about fellowships. There are tons of fellowships. Today, we we're talking about Fulbright. And apologies if you see my cats fighting behind me, um, they are coming in and out of the room. So Fulbright program. So what is the Fulbright program? You may have heard the term Fulbright and it's in a lot of different contexts because the Fulbright label is a big umbrella, but the program that we're talking about today and the program that we most often refer to as the Fulbright program is the Fulbright US student program. And so what that is, is a year of funding for folks who have, who have are between graduating with their bachelor's and a conferral of a PhD or other terminal degree. Basically anywhere in that, you're eligible for the Fulbright US student program. And so this program is intended to fund a year of graduate study, either independent or degree seeking, research, um, mostly independent research, English teaching, or a creative arts project abroad. So that's what this is. Intending to fund is a year of one of these experiences. Fulbright's overarching mission, like I mentioned before, is to foster mutual understanding between nations, advance knowledge across communities, and improve lives around the world. It was created in, by Congress in 1946 and is administered by the, the US government and um, international, uh, IIE, which I forget that stands for, the Institute of International Education, that sounds right. And it is a truly binational program. So when we say binational, we mean that it is jointly administered by the United States through the um, Department of or the Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and these uh, commissions or U.S. embassies that are located in the host country. So when we talk about the review process, when we talk about decision making, when we talk about um, your support structures for Fulbright. There is a U.S. side to this and also a host country side, and your application will be reviewed by both. So, um, of course, Fulbright wants to send Americans abroad and not just the kind of Hollywood cookie cutter version of Americans. They really want the folks who apply for and receive Fulbrights to represent the full spectrum of the American experience. So they are really looking for folks who identify with any and all identity groups who reflect the diversity of U.S. society and societies abroad. So there are as many American cultures in the Zoom today as there are like Americans. So thinking about what are some of the things that you bring to the table? What are some of the aspects of your culture that you can share with folks around the world? And Fulbright does also kind of approach G diversity and inclusion in that more traditional sense. They are looking for um, ways to support students throughout the Fulbright application, including recruitment through the application process, selection and placement, um, post-selection preparation and uh, pre-departure, and then through the program alumni as well. One thing about Fulbright that's really exciting is that they have a lot of different affinity groups, and those are usually made and administered by Fulbright, current Fulbrighters and Fulbright alumni. And they focus on supporting Fulbrighters from different identity backgrounds. So there is Fulbright Noir for Black and African American Fulbrighters. There is um, uh, Fulbright Prism, which is for LGBTQ folks. Um, there's Fulbright Lotus, which is for Southeast Asian Fulbrighters. So there are lots of different 
uh, affinity groups that can help you as you're preparing to go abroad and also supporting you while you're abroad and even afterwards. So there are plenty of supports available. Fulbright itself is an awesome um, mechanism for getting you that support. And of course, your host commissions will be hosting you and supporting you while you're in country. So if you have a question, don't hesitate to re reach out to Fulbright. They're extremely responsive and very willing to answer your questions and to help wherever they can. So this Fulbright U.S. Student Program, what are the requirements? So I mentioned um, that the time frame for this is going to be between the time that you graduate with your bachelor's and the time that you receive your doctorate, so a conferred doctoral degree. Um, you do have to be a U.S. citizen. This is U.S. funding. It's usually tied to U.S. citizenship by the application deadline. So the application deadline is in October, so you need to have your citizenship in hand if you don't already. By that application deadline. But the bachelor's degree is by the start of the grant. So you apply in October, but you won't be starting your grant until maybe October of 2025. So if you're a current um, junior, if you're a rising senior, if you're a recent graduate, graduate student, um, alumni, you're still eligible as long as you have that bachelor's degree by the time you start and you haven't yet received a doctorate um, at the time of your application. And then on top of all of this, there are additional country specific requirements, um, preferences. So the answer you're going to hear the most often when we talk about Fulbright is it depends because there are, again, as many American cultures as there are Americans in this room, as many um, answers to what's this thing that Fulbright does? What's their opinion on this? Like there's as many answers as there are different Fulbright's commissions. These are by national commission, so each country is a little bit different. And we'll show you where to find those um, different requirements, some that are common to, Fulb to all Fulbright applicants, some that are specific for um, the country that you're applying to. So what can you do with this Fulbright? So again, this is a kind of dual pronged sort of fellowship. So there are study research grants and there are English teaching assistantships. So overall, they um, award about 21, 2200 awards each year to about 140 countries worldwide. So lots of opportunity, lots of recipients. Um, and again, those are kind of divided into these two categories. So the study research grant covers a couple of different things. So if you are planning to get a graduate degree, which outside of the U.S., most master's programs are one year, so Fulbright would cover that one year of study or provide funding toward it. So you can do a graduate degree where you get a degree at the end of your program. You can do some independent coursework along with research. You can do a full research project, um, or you can do a creative arts project. So if you're a creative writer, you need to go somewhere to do research about something that you're writing about, that's where you would do the study research grant. And we do have someone who works specifically with creative arts projects. So if you are interested in exploring your creative art abroad, practicing it, uh, we have a faculty member who is very excited to talk with you. So that is the study research grant. It's a little less than half of the overall Fulbright awards. It can last anywhere from six to 12 months. And those will um, let you go to a wider range of countries. And a lot of that is because like some of these countries they wouldn't need English teaching assistantship because English is either a, a primary language or it's widely spoken. So with study research, you have a little bit more, uh, a few more locations available to you. And again, that's for an independent research project, a, a study grant, or an arts project. The other half of Fulbright is the English teaching assistantships. So these are more like English teaching jobs where you are serving as a uh, a, re an, a native English speaker in the classroom and uh, as a representative of U.S. culture. So you help te teach English, U.S. culture in the classroom alongside um, teachers from that country. So again, about 1,200 of these awards, eight to 10 months academic year and about 75 different countries. So depending on where you want to go, kind of where you want to go and what you want to do are the two biggest questions that you'll want to start thinking about as you're looking at Fulbright because you get one application per cycle. So that's one award type, one country, one application. So you do 
for this particular award need to focus on just one specific place. And that's something that we can help as advisors, um, help you think through where you might want to go, what you might want to do. And of course, narrowing that down and making that argument really clear as to why this particular program and location are a good fit for you and your goals, that's going to make you a good Fulbright applicant. And you're going to hear us talk about that a lot. And I'll introduce you later to my um, patent pending uh, fellowship fit funnel, which kind of visualizes that. So we'll talk through application components, and then I'm going to stop and check for any questions. So what is this application we talk about? So for Fulbright, they have, again, those um, pan Fulbright requirements that are for all Fulbright applicants. Then they also have these country specific requirements, which basically will tell you a little bit more about what that country is looking for. And if there's a language requirement, for example, if they require an arts portfolio, again, varies country to country. But basically the application consists of the following things personal data and program information, information about you, information about where you're going, what you're doing, um, host country engagement. Remember that Fulbright is primarily what they call a cultural ambassadorship program. So that means that they want people who are interested and engaged and curious and who want to share their experiences with others and learn about them in return. So really focused on building those mutual relationships. And one way that they kind of institutionalize that in the Fulbright application is by asking about host country engagement. How will you interact with folks while you are abroad in this country? And then they also, of course, ask about your future plans, how everything connects to your future goals. So that's the first part. The second and most substantial part is going to be the essays. So Fulbright is one of those that is kind of a deceptively short application. It, it doesn't seem like it's that short until you start writing and then you realize how hard it is to actually put everything into either two or one single space pages. So you get two different essays. The statement of grant purpose is the what, where, and how of your application. So what are you going to do? Which program are you studying? Um, what's your teaching philosophy if you're doing an ETA? So telling you about the grant and your suitability and your experience with and your interest in that grant. So for research and study, you will get two pages max. So that's single spaced, um, 12 point font, Times New Roman, all that. So two pages max. For English teaching assistantship, you get one. So again, this is your kind of bulk of your essay. This is why it's so important to spend time thinking and reflecting and narrowing down your choice of um, Fulbright application because you're going to really have this targeted essay that talks about why you want to be in this country. And speaking of why, there is also a personal statement. This is one page max for everybody. And so the personal statement, you can think of it as an interview on paper. How, like letting the committee get to know you, what motivates you to study or research the thing that you do? What kinds of experiences have you had that inspired you to take this path? Um, what other kind of personal details or personal stories in relation to kind of what you're hoping to do with the Fulbright can you tell? So that's what the personal statement is going to be. And that's kind of a newer genre for a lot of folks uh, when they're starting out for fellowships. So that's something we can help as well. Um, you will find that you'll be using I more often than you do in your academic papers throughout the Fulbright application. Because again, your, your job and your aim with this application is to connect your goals, your interests to your program and your country and ultimately to why Fulbright should fund your specific opportunity. The third part is references. So if you do have a language requirement for your country, you will need a foreign language evaluation from a university professor. And then you also need three references. So for our uh, study research folks, the three references are going to be standard letters of recommendation, kind of free form letters that folks will write for you. For our ETA folks, it's going to be a form that you fill out that at, that your recommender fills out. Please don't fill out your own recommendation form, pro tip. Um, but with that form, you're going to go, your recommender will go in there and answer a series of questions about your interest in and experience with some of the skills that will make you a good teacher in a classroom abroad. So 
when you start thinking about references, it's really important to think about what's the story you want to tell? What kind of things are you hoping that each of these recommenders will share about you? That And hopefully those align with aspects of um, what makes a good Fulbrighter, intellectual curiosity, openness to other cultures, um, adaptability and perseverance in the face of obstacles, interest in whatever you're doing, which I hope you have anyways. But you can think about who you would like to rec or recommend you, who you'd like to ask for those recommendations. And I would think, I would recommend actually thinking about that pretty early on in the process. So as you're starting to narrow down where you're going, go ahead and talk to those people that you think you want to ask for recommendations because a lot of those are going to be faculty, although there may be, again, some uh, more personal, not personal references, but more professional references, internship uh, coordinators, research supervisors, folks like that who can also attest to your skills. But a lot of people um, will go on vacation over the summer and a lot of the work on Fulbright that you all will be doing will be happening over the summer. So you wanna make sure that you catch your faculty before they go off to do their research or whatever they're doing over the summer, um, letting them know that you're going to ask this of them and helping to prepare them in advance. It's rarely too early to ask for a letter of recommendation. And as you go through the process, our team, um, again, I mentioned that USC, part of the Fulbright application, and that is basically a support structure designed to help you put forth your best application. And part of that we do is we have a bunch of resources about things like how to ask for recommendations, what makes a good recommendation, um, how to write a personal statement, all these different things. And we do a series of workshops over the summer, again, to help you prepare for the Fulbright application submission. Uh, transcripts, of course, um, they do want to look at your grades. You will notice something is missing from all of these requirements, and that is a GPA number. Um, so they do want you to have strong academics in your area of study. So if you are a French major, you should have some good French grades. If you don't, maybe you should reconsider that. But if you had, um, I don't know, statistics class that you didn't do too well in your first semester of college, that's not going to tank your application. They don't tie your academic preparation, your academic strength, the, the worth of your application to any specific grade point average. Um, if there is something that's like wildly out of character, you may explain that. Um, but usually if you've done, if you've exhibited academic strength in your area of study, you're good to go. Um, other things, so if you're doing a research or study grant, you will likely need what is called a letter of affiliation. So what is that? That is a letter from either the research institution, the university that you're working with, or that you hope to study with, that tells the Fulbright that, oh, we've talked about this student's application and their interest in coming to this institution, and we're really excited to welcome them here and provide support. So this is not financial support that they are providing. This is support in the form of giving you a desk to work at or helping you get access to the library or um, being someone that you can call if you need something while you're in the host country. And again, that's something that we provide resources for. Um, so you don't need to worry too much about that now. But again, this is one of those things that you will want to start working on early because what do people do in the summer? They go on vacation. And with this campus process, which I'll get to in a second, we do have a slightly earlier deadline than the October national deadline. And so that's why it's important to start thinking about these things and get the, get the machinery moving before we hit summer. And then if you are doing arts project, they may require supplementary materials, links to performances, photos, writing samples, things like that. All right. So uh, I said I was gonna pause, but we're gonna talk really quickly about award benefits because hopefully um, you've heard about those by now, but just to reiterate, again, with Fulbright, there's not a specific dollar amount that is tied to any one of these awards. Um, it's really hard to kind of quantify that because the cost of living and the standards are so different across all these different um, regions. And also some of the awards are a little bit more intangible, like tuition waivers or help with housing. So what you can expect from a Fulbright is the 
basic equivalent of a graduate student standard of living in the country in which you're doing your project. So it won't be, you won't be making money off of Fulbright, but Fulbright will help you to stay in the country and to do whatever it is you're proposing to do. So that includes airfare. It may include a monthly stipend. It includes insurance. Um, if you're doing the ETA, it gives you a TESOL fundamentals course to help you get started teaching English in your classroom abroad, which is a really great benefit. It may, again, depending on the country, there may be support for dependents. You may have a research allowance, tuition fees, uh, maybe waves. They may give you uh, funding for language lessons, enhancement activities, disability related accommodations. Again, Fulbright is very dependent on the country that you're going to. So all of these things may vary depending on your destination. And then of course, after the grant, not only will you have had this wonderful Fulbright experience, but you will also, of course, have access to the Fulbright and U.S. Department of State alumni networks, which are really great for networking, as the name implies, and also for um, making connections for career um, opportunities. They have a bunch of seminars that they do. Some of them are international, and they are really good about staying connected with alumni. If you are thinking of going into government work, um, Fulbright does give you a leg up there as well by giving you 12 months of non-competitive eligibility, which is basically a special hiring status that makes it easier for you to get a job within the federal government or with federal contractors. So definitely a, a bonus if you are already thinking of heading that direction. You get a Fulbright email address and access to the Fulbright Association. In terms of timeline, um, so you're starting early right now, which is excellent. Always what I recommend. Um, it's hard Again, it's hard to start too early, just like it's hard to ask for a recommendation too early. So what you'll be working on from now until October is designing your project, preparing your application, narrowing down what country you're going to, asking for those letters of recommendation and affiliation. And so you'll be working on that mostly from the spring through the summer. And then you'll see here, they have this kind of nebulous August to September campus deadline. What is that? So again, USC is trying to support applicants. We're not gatekeepers. Um, we are, you can actually apply for Fulbright and never even talk to our team. That's fine. I wouldn't recommend it because I think we have a lot of great resources to offer, but you don't have to come to our office. There's no cap on the number of students that can apply from our university. The campus process that we talk about is just here to help support you and help you put for, forward your most competitive application. And probably the most helpful thing we do in that is we have this campus deadline, which is gonna be August 14th. And for that, you need to submit your, your draft, a polished version of your Fulbright draft. It doesn't have to be the final, in fact, it probably won't be, but something that's been polished, something that you've worked on. And we actually take those drafts and we assemble committees of faculty, who are familiar with your discipline, your area that you're going to with Fulbright, and they actually read your application and you get to sit down in a room with them for 30 to 45 minutes and they give you feedback, which is an amazing way to strengthen your application by having these faculty review your materials. Um, so definitely recommend hitting that campus deadline if you at all possibly can. And since you are starting early, I really hope you will. But after that process, you get your application back with all that wonderful feedback and you have until October to finish up your application. I noticed I have the wrong deadline here. That is from last year. This year's deadline is October 8th. And after that, it will go to a national screening committee, which is made up of US faculty, um, advisors, experts, who are going to take a look at your application and recommend uh, folks to move on to the second phase of review, which will be by the Fulbright commissions in your host country. So you will be writing for both a US audience and also an audience of people from your host country. So keep that in mind when you're preparing your application. And so you'll, we'll find out in January who has moved forward in the competition. And then somewhere between March and June, it comes on a rolling basis and the waiting is endless, but somewhere between March and June, you will be notified of final selections. So whether or not you've received an award or been named an alternate, you'll be notified between March and June of next year and then you'll be hopefully starting your Fulbright year either in the fall or maybe even the spring, fall of 2025 or the spring of 2026 depending on which hemisphere you're going to. Clear as mud? 
All right, I'm gonna pause here for questions. Feel free to throw them in the chat or to unmute yourself. Matt, did I miss anything major? I don't think so. All right. Okay. Yes, we have one question. Can you receive the Fulbright more than once? That's actually a really good question. So maybe it depends. It's always the answer for Fulbright. So with Fulbright, um, for the US student program, usually people will, re will receive it once. But if, for example, you do an English teaching assistantship right after you graduate and then, I don't know, three, four or five years down the road, you are doing a PhD and you have some really interesting research you want to do, you can apply for a Fulbright research grant and you may receive it if you have that um, compelling case for why you need to be in the country doing that research and why Fulbright should fund it. So you can potentially receive more than once, although it's not super common and probably not for the same thing. All right, you're welcome. So um, we talk about this uh, Fulbright and what it is and all about the application process, but what about you? What makes a good Fulbright applicant? So again, the quality and feasibility of your proposal. So what we mean when we talk about quality and feasibility is thinking about the connection between you, the program you've chosen, and can you actually do what you set out to do within that one year. So if you can't research like every single, like, I don't know, insect in Nova Scotia within a year, that's just not gonna be possible. So thinking about what are you able to accomplish in a year? What are your goals and are they realistic? Have you laid them out with enough detail to show folks that you are capable of doing what you say you're gonna do? And quality again comes down to fit, thinking about like, okay, I'm gonna study like insects in Nova Scotia. Um, you wouldn't want to try to study Nova Scotian insects in, I don't know, Portugal. That wouldn't make any sense. So you want to make sure that your proposal makes sense. Again, strong academics, especially in your area of focus, not necessarily tied to any one GPA, but making sure that if you're going to study insects, that you have some really good insect grades. I picked the wrong example for this. But anyways, we go on. So again, the clear articulation of why you need to do this thing in this place. So again, if you want to study, um, I don't know, Polish um, organ music from the 1700s, and the only archive that exists for that is in Warsaw. Like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense as to why you need to go to Warsaw to continue doing your research on Polish um, 18th century organ music. There you go. See, it makes sense that way. Or... Um, you don't have to be like white that specialized necessarily, but say you are interested in uh, becoming a professor one day. And so you say, oh, I want to do an English teaching assistantship in Colombia because I need to build my Spanish skills because I want to be able to teach in multiple languages or I want to be a Spanish instructor and I want to develop uh, classroom and pedagogical skills. Excellent. That's a great reason to go to Colombia. Um, or we even have folks who are from outside of teaching disciplines going to do ETA. So it really just depends on how you can make the case for why you need to do this thing in this place and why now is the right time. And again, we talk about this um, commitment to serving as a cultural ambassador. That's kind of, again, that nebulous term. But think about it as what do you want to share from your culture, your experience, your interests? And what do you want to learn? How do you how do you want to explore that curiosity abroad? And Matt, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything about kind of what that experience was like as a Fulbrighter and doing research, how you fulfilled that commitment to cult cultural ambassadorship. Yeah, so for, so for me, it was maybe a little different. And that's that's one thing that I would I would say is that um, while the general Fulbright program has this kind of commitment here. I think it plays out a little differently depending on the type of award you're applying for. So, so mine was a research grant. And so while I don't think that that means that the cultural engagement piece is unimportant there, I do think if you're applying for a research grant, that's kind of the, that's the most important thing when it comes to the review. 
Um, and, you know, if, if, if you have great plans for cultural engagement and you haven't kind of explained the significance of the project, then you're, you're probably not going to be taken seriously for that opportunity. Um, whereas if you're going for the English Teaching Assistant Award in many countries, the teaching um, requirement or component is maybe, you know, half of your time, like 20 hours a week. It varies. Sometimes it's more in other countries there. Uh, but in a lot of places, the expectation is that you might be developing kind of a cultural engagement or some kind of project um, that goes along with that. That's oftentimes kind of based around maybe your own interests and things there. So my mine was, was research related. And so um, for me, that looks like getting involved at the university that I had an affiliation with. Um, uh, there was not any sort of formal requirement that I do anything there. They, they had agreed to provide me with letters that I needed to get access to the archives and things, but, but I ended up um, attending voluntarily a, a seminar that was being offered by one of the institutes at the university for graduate students. And so I would go to the weekly courses there. I participated in a round table about um, teaching in international schools that they organized um, for or other students at the university there, I presented on my research um, along with other students. We each had like a, uh, a session that we could present as part of that. I, you know, I did the weekly readings and things there. Um, so that was that was sort of the main focus of what mine looked like. But again, I think if you were doing like an English teaching award, having a more ambitious kind of project um, would be something that might just be expected there. Um, and I knew people who, uh, who were doing ETA projects i went to russia that year who were doing things like organizing fitness classes uh, because you know that was something that they had experience with before so they were going to do like zumba um or um you know some of them who were doing things like organizing like english movie night thing uh, activities for for their students and then for other sort of people there so um you know it can look like a number of different things it can often be connected with your interest there was somebody else i knew who was really who, um, who was really involved in CrossFit in the U.S. This was somebody else with a research grant. Um, and he found a CrossFit gym in Moscow and um, and got really involved in that and met some people um, through that kind of experience as well. So it doesn't have to look like any one particular thing. And again, thinking about the things that you're interested in, what are you excited to share about or connect with? Um, you know, it could be a hobby. It could be a particular skill, related to music. It could be something more kind of academic focused. Um, but like what Heidi was saying, Fulbright's not looking for just one thing here. Um, they're not expecting you to sort of toe the party line or, or like be a mouthpiece for whatever the official policy the U.S. government has in that country. Um, they want you to, to, to share what the United States is like by sharing your own interests and your own you know, diverse experiences there. Thank you. And we have a good question in the chat is, uh, is there only one award like given by each country? And the answer is no. Um, I'm not going to explicitly tell you where you can find those numbers. You definitely can find statistics about um, Fulbright countries and how many awards they give, how many applicants they have each cycle. Um, the number of awards actually depends, again, as with everything in Fulbright, on the country and where um, you're planning to go and even the year and type. So they probably won't give just one, but they, I don't know, usually have a certain number that they give, but as an applicant, you only get one shot um, per year. But again, if you wanna apply multiple years, say you think you wanna do an ETA and two, three years down the line, um, you decide you want something else, or you wanna uh, try for an ETA in a different country the next year, if you don't get accepted, those things are possible as well. So hopefully that answered your question. All right, so uh, language proficiency, which again, depends on the country. One important thing to note about Fulbright language is that, or like their language that they use on the website as well as foreign languages, but they will use kind of two terms. So one is required, and that means that is a minimum requirement that they need you to fulfill to review your application at all. So if it says, uh, beginner Spanish is required. If you've never taken a Spanish class, your application is not going to be eligible for that and they'll, they won't review your application. But um, required is different from recommended. So if they recommend that you have intermediate to advanced Spanish, you probably should to be competitive. So recommended is kind of the threshold for competitiveness. That's not to say that someone with a beginner level would never have that award if they recommend that you have an intermediate level, but there would have to be 
some other factors at play, but they do have a preference for folks who have a higher level of whatever they're asking for. So required, minimum needed to review, recommended, what you should have to be competitive in that for that award. Okay. And then finally, I've talked about it this entire time, the patented fellowship fit funnel. So as you're thinking about the program, you really want to draw a clear line between you and the award you're applying for, in this case, Fulbright. So what you want to start with is why you, what are your interests? What are your goals? What are your passions? Um, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, what about you makes you a good fit for this, this, per, this thing that you're doing, this project or program? So why you, what about you and your skills and your goals really fit for this program or project? And that's something um, to think about. It doesn't have to be like the most prestigious program. For example, if you're applying to graduate school, um, everyone thinks, oh, I'm going to apply for Oxford. This is probably not the best vehicle for that anyways, but thinking about why is this program or project a good fit for you? Yes, Oxford is an amazing school, but is it the best fit for you? Um, so really thinking about what elements of your program uh, make it a really good fit. If it, for example, you're interested in, I don't know, post-conflict societies, um, going to Northern Ireland might be a great fit for you. Uh, if you're interested in bugs of Nova Scotia, it might not. So, you know, thinking about the, the fit of your program or project. Why is this location um, a good fit for you? So again, thinking about what is it about the location? It can be something as specific as I need to get into these archives to more about um, language goals to even, um, I had another example and now I've lost it. But even thinking about like, why couldn't you do why could you only do this thing here? Or why do you want to do this thing here as opposed to in the US? So really kind of being attentive to why you want to be in your particular location. Why is now the best time for you to do this thing? Um, a lot of people will do Fulbright kind of as a first step out of college. So why is that a good timing for you? If you have been in the workforce for a while or you're a graduate student, why is now a good time for you to take, take that time and go do this Fulbright project. So really thinking about kind of where it fits in the context of your life as well. And then finally, something that is important to know again is why Fulbright? Why should Fulbright be the one that funds this experience for you? Why, why are you applying for Fulbright and not for Erasmus Mundus or um, the Marshall program to go study in the UK? Why is Fulbright the one that attracted you? So for that, thinking about the values, missions, and goals of Fulbright. So if you really vibe with that uh, mutual understanding element, the community engagement, that's going to be that kind of why Fulbright that really helps you to stand out as an applicant. And hopefully you are going to align with all of these wonderful things that Fulbright offers, but showing that all of those different things clearly is going to make your application that more, that much more compelling. So again, why Fulbright? Make sure you address it. So before I do this, and I'm going to do a time check, it, we have about 13 minutes left. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen sharing to show you the Fulbright website. Um, if you have questions, now is a good time to unmute or to put them in the chat while I pull up the Fulbright website to show you just a couple of things. All right, so uh, this is the Fulbright U.S. Student Program website. So when you're looking at this, remember Fulbright's a big umbrella, make sure it says Fulbright U.S. Student Program. That's the one you want. So this is where you're going to find just a ton of information about Fulbright um, and the information that you need to look at different awards, different countries, all sorts of good information. So when we talk about Fulbright, again, there are those two sets of requirements. One set of requirements is the, um, the Pan Fulbright application requirements, the standard components for each of the award types. And then there are also the country specific requirements which depend on where you're going. So to find the Pan Fulbright requirements, you go to applicants and then to application components. And so that's where depending, I always do that. Um, so depending on which type of research or type of project you're doing, 
um, that's where you'll find the information on the application components. So this will tell you everything that they're looking for. So again, some things are pretty standard, biographical data, personal information. The statement of grant purpose, um, again, this is going to tell you not only what questions you should think about, what kind of information they want to see from you, but also things like formatting, which are important in, in fellowship applications like Fulbright because you do need to adhere to whatever guidelines they have set. So make sure you're looking over those. And for those of you who are interested in doing a study or research grant, it's kind of confusing because they've lumped study and research together, um, but they actually are two kind of separate things within the same award type, if that makes sense. Um, so if you are doing a study or a research grant, just know that within this um, information about the statement of grant purpose, there are kind of two sections and they're not super clearly defined. So I will say they do the independent study or research projects first. So if you are doing a graduate degree, don't follow these questions, jump down further down the page where they talk about graduate degrees. Um, you don't need to do a project if you're doing a graduate degree, although if you do have a research or an academic question, definitely something to talk about. But if you're doing an independent research project, who are you working with? What are you doing? Um, what about this is innovative? What kind of methodologies are you going to use? What kind of cultural considerations are there? So lots of questions to really help you flesh out this thing that you're hoping to do. And again, feasibility, you're going to hear that term over and over again. So making sure that it, it is something that's doable. And then for those of you who are doing our graduate degree programs, again, halfway down the page, they'll ask you things like, why do you want to do this program? Why do you want to do it in um, Iceland as opposed to in the United States? What's the benefit of that? Uh, do you have the sufficient language skills you need to do this program? So they'll have, again, those guiding questions. And again, this is something that like see two pages seems like a lot until you start writing it. And then it it becomes not a lot very quickly. And we're happy to um, help you as you go through the process in trimming down if you need to, offering feedback on your essays um, and helping you to fit within these Fulbright guidelines. Um, it'll tell you more about the affiliation letter, which again, is not a financial letter of support, but it's something from the institution you'll be working with or studying at that says, yeah, we're excited to support this student in X, Y, and Z ways. Personal statement, um, again, is basically the why of your Fulbright, um, and that will tell, tell you a little bit more about how to write up that personal statement and, again, some formatting information. So that's where you'll find the kind of pan Fulbright information. Now, this is where all the it depends comes in. So these countries, like there are, again, about 140 different countries that you can go to to potentially do your Fulbright. Um, so again, where you, where you study is going to really dictate kind of what things you want to highlight in your Fulbright um, program, if you need language requirements, things like that. Um, I heard Iceland, and I'm feeling Iceland today, so we'll take a look at them. So for Iceland, um, and we asked kind of what are the numbers of awards that they have available each year, they actually tell you how many awards are available in these little circles. Um, so interesting to know, but again, like your most competitive Fulbright application is going to be the one that you're the best fit for. And you'll find as you go through this, they don't have an ETA to Iceland because English is very widely spoken there, um, but they have these different named awards. So as you look at these different countries, you may find the Open Study Research Award, which is basically to study at any university or to do any research project within a country that's open, like there's no tie to a particular institution. They have those as well as they may have some options that are specific to certain types of activities, like this one is Arctic Research. Awesome. Um, they also will have some that are tied to specific universities or specific areas of study. So just, again, read these application, um, these program pages very carefully. It will tell you a lot about um, what they're looking for. They give you an award profile, so what the award is like. Um, they do have special funding for disabled grantees. So there you go. Go to Iceland. Um, grant length, grant period. Uh, candidate profile. So again, saying who they are looking for in their particular 
country. So this one does uh, welcome all degree levels. Some places may have preferences for different um, levels of study, recently graduated up to folks who are doing their dissertation. And they tell you what you can do with that particular country. Um, again, degree level of applicant, whether or not you need foreign language proficiency and any information about that. And then they tell you whether and what kind of program you can do. So whether or not you can do independent study, a graduate degree, or either. More about the affiliation letter, more about affiliation fees and tuition. Again, um, Fulbright is a funding mechanism, so it's very important to know if you are planning to apply for a university program is you still do need to apply to the university. Um, this is not an admissions uh, application. This is a funding application. So you need to also apply for admission to your university whenever those deadlines would be. So uh, the Fulbright may or, or may not uh, cover tuition and fees. But again, outside of the U.S., those fees tend to be a bit more pocket friendly. Um, they tell you if you can bring a dependent with you. So if you have a child or spouse, they let you know if there is financial support available or if um, they would recommend leaving uh, the folks at home and going on, on your solo. So housing arrangements and some Fulbright contacts. So Fulbright is extremely um, responsive. So if you have questions, definitely reach out to Fulbright, reach out to us as advisors. Oh, this one actually does have dollar amounts. Excellent. Um, I think they're trying to move towards that. But you will find that, um, so right now, all of the information is from this last cycle. And while Fulbright doesn't change wildly from year to year, there may be some updates. They are going to open the application for this next cycle in April of 2024. So check back in the first week of April and just double check that everything you thought was true still is. Okay, and then I have just a few minutes. So let's see. I am going to stop my share and, or can you see, you can see this, right? Okay, cool. So we talked about this campus process. So what does that mean? So from now until June, what you'll want to do is connect with our office. So meet with one of our advisors, talk through your plans about Fulbright, and complete what is called the preliminary application, which is what you'll get after you've met with us. And it's basically just gathering information about you, about your, your Fulbright plans, what you're interested in. And we use that information to uh, get you access to one of our other amazing benefits, which is getting paired with a faculty Fulbright program advisor and mentor. So these are faculty who have worked with us and worked with Fulbright applicants over the years. And by going through this preliminary application process, you will actually be paired with a mentor who is there to help you brainstorm, to read over essays, to provide another um, set of supportive hands as you move through this process. So that's a really great opportunity. Again, if you can um, get into the process pretty early, that's a, a great benefit. Usually we ask for those uh, preliminary applications Priority deadline May 1st, but at least um, by July 1st to kind of get you into that process. And again, a lot of this um, work will be happening over the summer. So you'll be working on drafts of your application materials, reaching out to contacts. Um, and we do, again, host that series of workshops over the summer, usually virtually, um, so that we have that to kind of help you stay on track because Fulbright is definitely not a sprint. It is a merit. So the, the further in advance you can start, the, the better you'll be able to kind of pace yourself over these um, coming months. And so I mentioned the campus deadline, that is gonna be August 14th. So what the campus deadline is again, is when you give us a polished dress rehearsal draft of your Fulbright application that we then share with um, campus committees for feedback. And we'll schedule those uh, feedback sessions between late August and mid-September. And again, that's one of the best benefits we offer. So please put August 14th in your brain and in your calendar for um, applying for Fulbright, because that's really going to give you the best chance at um, moving on to semifinalists and maybe even finalist stage. And so August to September, you'll be doing those feedback sessions. You'll be incorporating that feedback. And then your final submission will be in mid-October. October 8th is the, the deadline for Fulbright. 
So you don't have to do it alone to go back to our fellowship of the rings um, joke that I told at the top of the hour. Um, you don't have to do this alone. You have a big team here at USC that's here to help. So you have our national fellowships advisor, myself and Matt are kind of the primary Fulbright advisors, but everyone is cross-trained. Everyone can help you at least get started. Um, you have your faculty. If you get into our process, you have your faculty uh, FPAs that will help you out throughout the process. You have fellowship peer mentors um, who will actually um, pay for you to have a coffee with them. And you can talk about fellowships all day long. We don't have folks there specifically for um, Fulbright on our website right now, but there are plenty of students who are fellowship peer mentors for other awards that they've received who have also applied for Fulbright. So we're happy to connect you with them to talk about what the process is like. Uh, we do have the committee members, we have different campus partners, Office of Research, Career Center, Writing Center, OMSA, your friends and family, and others that may be in your network that can help you out. So one of the people that can help you out is um, Kylie Stoge, who is a graduate student, um, PhD candidate in biology, I believe. And she actually did a Fulbright Nehru Research Award grant to India um, before she came to us at USC. And she has been very, very excited to get to talk to all sorts of different students about her experience and about what it's like to apply for and receive a Fulbright grant. Um, so she has generously uh, let us share her information. So feel free to give her a direct email or to reach out to us if you want to talk to her a little bit more about her experience. I'm um, trying to remember exactly what she was researching. Do you remember, Matt? Uh, I'm trying to remember the exact deal. It had to do with basically like um, sort of like a historical archaeology, something about like the record oh, yeah. of like different plants. Um, yeah, yeah, medicinal like, uses of plants in yeah, the archaeology, yeah, archaeological ancient, record. Yeah, ancient medicine um, in India. So, yeah, very fascinating. It was very cool. Yeah, and she's great to talk to. So definitely take her up on that if you're able to. All right. So I know we are at 7.01. So I'm going to um, skip that, come back to that. So. Uh, final thoughts, how to craft a strong application, finding your fit, again, kind of determining which uh, Fulbright award you want to apply for. That's half of the battle um, when it comes to creating this Fulbright application. So really finding the one that's going to be a good fit for you and you can make that really strong argument of why you, why this program, why this location, why now, and why Fulbright. Start early, which you already have, so you can check that one off your list. Get to know your faculty. Again, you'll be asking folks for letters of recommendation. You may want to have them read over your application materials or help you develop your research ideas. So definitely making sure that you're staying in touch with and deepening those relationships with faculty that are here to help support you. And in my experience, faculty are usually pretty excited about stuff like this. And as you're looking for Fulbright, again, it's a little bit more depth over breadth. So it's not so much showing all of the different things that you are interested in and want to do. It's more about, again, going down that fit funnel and saying why this particular thing is a good thing for you and really focusing on kind of the depth of that one thing that you want to do. Demonstrating your interests. Again, that can be academic. It can be, I don't know, teaching a Zumba class in Russia, but being a little bit personable um, in the personal statement and other places are a great way to do that. And we can help you kind of figure out how to how to fit your authentic self on the page. One important thing to note is for Fulbright, many of these awards don't ever interview applicants. Some of them do, um, a good number do, but your written application may be the only thing someone sees. So it's really important to kind of put yourself on the page. And that's something that we can help you with and that you'll develop as you move through this Fulbright process. And to help you do that, it's really important that you are open to feedback. So really thinking about um, like being receptive to folks telling you things, you're going to get a lot of different and possibly conflicting advice as you get people to read your application. So taking it all in and um, laying it all out on the table and figuring out what feels authentic and true to you. You are the ultimate author of your application. So it's up to you what makes it into the, the final submission. And you know yourself best. But a lot of us have experience, and from reading some of these applications, we may tell you what we think would make your application the strongest, 
Um, so being open to that feedback is going to make this a really good process for you. Writing, um, although you are, of course, the author, it is kind of a team sport. There are a lot of people involved in supporting your writing. Um, use your resources, us, your faculty, different uh, campus resources, but make sure not to be a stranger. So how do we get started with this whole thing? So one, take a look at the Fulbright website, knowing that it's gonna be updated in April, but a lot of the information does stay the same. So go ahead and start poking around, see what you got. They have a lot of recorded webinars and all sorts of great information there. And then next, make an appointment with a fellowship advisor to discuss the application process. If you're an undergrad, you can find us on Navigate. Again, you can meet with either myself or Matt Klopfenstein, um, we are the kind of Fulbright specialists, so we'd be probably the best people to talk to about Fulbright specifically. If you have more general Fulbright questions, our entire team is cross-trained and can help you out. But undergrads can find us on Navigate. Grad students can either um, go to calendly.com slash gradfellowships or calendly.com slash hbretts, that's my personal one, um, to set up an appointment. And we do do virtual and in-person appointments. So no matter where you are, we can meet with you. All right, questions. Hi there, can I ask a question? Sure, please do. Yeah, so I'm interested in um, if you have any tips or recommendations in terms of establishing um, this relationship with oh, um, yeah. with the institution that you hope to be affiliated with. And then um, Matt, you had kind of mentioned it. Do we, although the, the cultural ambassadorship uh, component perhaps is not so strong for, or not as, re like if you're going there to do research, um, I don't know, is it like, is, is it recommended to maybe confer with that institution in terms of what kind of, what you might be able to offer or like, how, how do you recommend like even beginning to think about what you could offer, I guess. And are, is that okay. a good, you know, just kind of some advice, I guess, in that yeah. capacity. Yeah. Matt, do you want to talk about this one? Sure. I would say in terms of the affiliation, um, you know, there are a couple ways you can do that. We oftentimes um, applicants end up kind of just reaching out to, to someone they've identified with a cold email. Um, that's totally fine. Um, I was able to get my affiliation in part through a connection that my advisor had, um, just knew somebody. So faculty who might have a colleague at another institution or, you know, even just sort of an indirect kind of connection where they can say that can help facilitate as well, even if it's maybe not, you know, an immediate research collaborator. But even when you make that initial outreach and say, you know, name of my advisor recommended that I reach out to you because of X and Y, I'm considering um, a Fulbright grant um, for, you know, this particular kind of project here and would be you know, interested in, in, in whether I might be able to, you know, have your support for this and kind of explain what that what that would look like there so so that's one possibility um and i think it's important too to kind of in that initial conversation just kind of make clear what it what it doesn't entail like what heidi mentioned as well it's not like a financial commitment um you know from from fulbright's perspective it's largely about making sure that there's someone in country who can provide some guidance that you're not just kind of on your own um with with sort of the project that you're pursuing there so i think you know figuring out who is doing work that might be relevant, um, who might be interested in whatever it is that you're proposing, um, that that would provide a kind of a natural point of connection, you know, if this person's leading expert in this field or they have an existing project or something, or they're the head of a center or, you know, whatever the case might be and explaining like, this is what I'm doing, um, you know, love the opportunity to, to talk with you and, and, you know, would appreciate your potential guidance in some of that. Um, and again, you know, thinking about, do you know anybody who might be able to kind of facilitate that or, or even someone that you could mention when you're reaching out um, who has some sort of connection there? Or even if it's not personal, just sort of in general saying, you know, like somebody who is who has you know, done work with this institution or something, can, that can be something that's useful. In, in terms of like the, the cultural engagement piece, um, that's not necessarily something that needs to be touched on in like the letter of affiliation. I mean, those letters, they can vary. The, the one that I got was was honestly quite short. I would say it's shorter than most of the ones that, that the applicants that we have are. Um, but basically, they're just looking to see that somebody knows who you are and that they are they are going to be able to 
to provide whatever it is is the case there. It doesn't have to, I mean, it's certainly helpful if somebody wants to write an enthusiastic endorsement of, of the project and say, yes, this is super exciting, can't wait for um, for you to get here and, and those sort of things. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that detailed and it can be just be more focused on the, um, on the particular you know, scholarly project or whatever that you're proposing. Um, in terms of like what you can say for the other things there, I mean, we often, we recommend if you have sort of something that you're thinking about doing or you have a particular area of interest, doing a little research and, and saying, you know, seeing what's available there. So, you know, if you love working with animal shelters here, is there one that, that you know is available there? The expectation isn't for those sort of things that you would already have established contact with them necessarily. Although, you know, if you have some sort of connection, that's, that's always useful to flag. But just showing that you've done a little bit of thought about that, you know, like, I know that there's a very active runners club in Barcelona or something like that. Um, or again, you know, like these are, or there are these organizations and, uh, and, you know, I can, I have some sense of sort of the kind of work that they're doing, um, or these kind of clubs are available at the, at the organization there. So it's a chance to show that you have not just some interest in some things that you might be able to share there, but you, you've taken at least that next step and done a little bit of investigating to see what sort of options might be available. And so um, there's a short answer portion of the Fulbright application to talk about the your plans for cultural engagement that everybody addresses in addition to the things you might mention like in the personal statements. Um, but it's not, I don't remember the exact word count, but but it's not a huge amount of space there. So, so Fulbright at this stage is not expecting like a detailed, um, you know, kind of, plan of outreach and, and sort of justification there. Um, and, and and you will, if you receive the award, like there, you'll have to submit occasional reports to basically saying the sort of things that you're doing there. Um, but it's also not the sort of thing where it's like a contract where, um, because you know, you're not there in the country, things might happen, maybe your initial idea is not feasible or you realize there's this other cool opportunity you had no idea about and so you got there. And so um, it's really just, it's truly really trying to demonstrate that you've thought about that a little bit, you've thought a little bit about what might actually be feasible in that country, that you're not proposing something that's just, that's just kind of a non-starter um, because it doesn't exist or because it's the sort of thing where it's like, you wouldn't be able to do it because you would need certain permission or things that, are, that would be unlikely. Um, so, so any kind of research that, that you can point to that, that indicates that, um, you know, you've kind of thought about what that looks like there, but that's not something that really needs to be addressed in the letter of affiliation, I would say. And also one of the shortcuts um, I recommend for affiliation is like you're at USC, look and see what study abroad partners USC has. That's always a place to, that I say, start looking to see like, oh, is there someone already in Iceland with a university that we already have? Um, some sort of contact with and maybe even asking the education abroad office to put you in touch with their education abroad office and then kind of follow that down the rabbit hole. Um, but that's one way to do it or to look at people on LinkedIn um, and see who has like a dream job or who has kind of the career path that you're thinking of and see where they went to school <laughs> and see if it would be somewhere that might have a program that would be of interest to you. Ask your faculty. So um, there are definitely ways to figure it out. And if all else fails, you can even contact Fulbright and they may be able to help you out with like recommendations. And then, uh, yeah, sorry, Amy, do you have another follow up? I was just gonna say thank you, but it sounds like you have more ideas. So that's useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. So we have a really good question um, from Abby in the chat about specific examples of creative projects um, that people have won a Fulbright fellowship for. So we have been kind of looking for more creative arts candidates within, uh, USC in particular, and Fulbright more generally. So with creative arts projects, there are also kind of like two camps there as well. So it really depends on whether or not you want to practice your art or your um, performing art, creative art abroad, or if you want to do research on your art. So if you want to do like research on your art, say you want to go and again, research those, um, those organ the organ sheet music in Poland, that would be more of a research grant. But if you, for example, um, and again, this gets kind of tricky. So this is why we have a faculty member who we can help point you to, to talk about this. Um, but thinking about like, oh, do I need to go and like actually like intern with someone um, to learn this particular organ technique? Or if you are um, doing creative writing and you need to go there to kind of get certain 
information that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. I know they told the story and this is like very, very specific and very, very high level. And this is not every Fulbright by any means, but um, there was a creative arts candidate, I think that won the um, UK Open Study Research Grant, which is probably the single most competitive because a lot of people like the UK and a lot of people like want to do lots of things in the UK. But the person who received it was an author who was writing a book about the bombings like the London bombings and needed to like do some firsthand kind of experiential uh, research of how like his voice echoed in the tunnels um, to think about how to incorporate that, that into his novel. So like, that's one very specific example, but like things like that. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Any advice, Matt? Yes, I'm, I'm not sure if the, is the question about like what a creative project would look like, or is the question about do we have sample proposals of somebody who's won an arts uh, or creative project Fulbright? Um, Abby, what which which one is a little bit more aligned with yours? Sorry, I was wondering if you had specific examples. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to look back um, to see in our archives um, and that's one thing that again uh, working with us you do get access to things like this which are uh, we do have a number of anonymized um, samples of USC successful Fulbright applications that you'll get access to that you can take a look at you can get inspiration from but again remembering that no Fulbright like there's no one way to, to get a Fulbright there's not one Fulbright one way to be a Fulbright applicant um, but I can check and see if we have creative arts projects, uh, excuse me, in our um, annals. And if not, we can definitely kind of point you towards where you might find some of those inf that information. Um, the fact where we work with is uh, Professor Laura Kissel in the um, College of Visual and Performing Arts. And she has been on the, the Fulbright Creative Arts Review Committee for quite a while for documentary filmmaking. Um, and I believe, did she, I think she actually um, received a Fulbright for filmmaking in China. I feel like I should know that. That's my best guess. Okay. All right, other questions? All right, well, thank you all for coming. This has been Great, hopefully you got some good information. I will send out the recording and the slides. I know that was kind of an avalanche coming at you, but long story short, please reach out to us, um, reach out to us early so that we can help you submit your most competitive application. Thank you for having this and hosting it. Thanks for all the information. You're welcome, yeah. Thank you.